When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, everybody. I'm Jared Halverson, and welcome back to another year of Unshaken. Depending on when you're watching this video, it's probably early 2021 for you, in which case I hope you had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The Book of Mormon is in our rearview mirror now, and the Doctrine and Covenants stretches ahead into the distance. And I hope you're as excited about studying this book of Scripture as I am. For those of you who were with me last year in the Book of Mormon, thank you for an incredible journey together. Nearly a hundred hours of content in the Book of Mormon. And what began as kind of a garage band YouTube channel, intended just to meet the needs of a few hundred of my institute students and anyone who happened to wander in the back of the classroom, has since grown into something that went far beyond anything I would have envisioned. We hit a million views right around October General Conference. We'll hit two million within the next couple of weeks. I'm amazed by your comments and your questions. I wish I had time to respond to them all. We since have expanded into a podcast version for those that are too busy to sit and watch or don't want to use up all of your phone time. Uh, that's Unshaken Saints on any of the podcast uh, apps that you might use, as well as a Facebook version since a lot of you missionaries were asking for uh, a chance to be able to learn these lessons and watch these videos even when YouTube is not accessible to you. So whether you've joined me on YouTube or on a podcast or on Facebook, I'm so grateful that you joined me to spend time together in the Scriptures. For those of you who are new to the channel and are hoping to deepen your understanding of the Doctrine and Covenants this year and come follow me, like I said, my name is Jared Halverson, originally from Southern California, went on a mission to Puerto Rico, came back and taught at the MTC, began teaching seminary and institute, been doing that for the last 21 years with amazing youth and young adults around the country. When I was uh, directing the institute program in Nashville, I jumped into a Bible Belt Divinity School at Vanderbilt University where I pursued a second master's degree and a PhD in American religious history. So I'm doubly excited for the Doctrine and Covenants to be able to see not just the history of our church, but the history of American religion and the kinds of answers that are found in the Doctrine and Covenants, not just to Joseph Smith's questions, but to the questions that people have been wondering for a long, long time. My area of specialization for my PhD work is in anti-religious rhetoric, which admittedly is odd. I study anti-Mormonism and anti-Semitism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Methodism. You name the faith, there's been people to attack it. And my hope is to fortify faith, to help you become unshaken, hence the name of the channel. And as we study the Doctrine and Covenants together, although the focus of these lessons will be on the scriptural text, it's never very far from the historical context. And a lot of that is the, the messiness of church history. And to be able to see how people have attacked our faith and how the early saints responded to it. We're not very far from that, not just historically, but personally. And if you or those that you love have struggled in your faith, I hope these lessons will be a blessing to you. I will say that I've probably taught the Doctrine and Covenants more than any other single book of Scripture. And I am amazed by this incredible book. Now for this first week of Come Follow Me, we're supposed to be studying section one of the Doctrine and Covenants, and I promise we'll get there. It is a literary masterpiece, one of my favorite sections in the book. But before we get there, let me back up and tell you a little bit about what the Doctrine and Covenants is and how it came to be. Now every time I shift from teaching some other book of scripture to the Doctrine and Covenants, I can't help but think about my grandma Wilcox. She was as saintly a woman as anyone I've ever met. She raised her three children as a single mother in the 1940s and 50s on a kindergarten teacher's salary and on healthy helpings of the Book of Mormon. That was her keystone scripture. And few people I've ever met love the Book of Mormon quite like Grandma Wilcox. She didn't quite feel the same about the Doctrine and Covenants. I can still picture her in my head kind of waving it away anytime I would bring it up. And she'd always say, oh, it's just a book of rules, just a book of rules. Sadly, I don't think she's alone in that. As Latter-day Saints, we love the Book of Mormon. We tend to lose interest somewhat when it comes to the Doctrine and Covenants. We have the same problem in the New Testament. We love the first half, the, the stories of Jesus. But as soon as we shift to the second half and there's no more stories, it's just Paul theologizing, 
unfortunately, we tend to lose interest. And that's a tragedy because the letters of Paul are incredible. And the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants are incredible too. But the challenge for the Doctrine and Covenants is its lack of storyline. Now, it's there, it's just not in the text. For that, we have to find the context to see what comes with con, the text, what's around it, what's the historical background. And we'll do some of that, although I really want to focus on the the textual revelations themselves in this year. But it is so much more than a book of rules. Now, I'll admit that Grandma had some history on her side when she said it, because the original title for this book was the Book of Commandments, which I guess makes it sound like a book of rules. But although Grandma was really old when she passed away, she's not old enough to have remembered the Book of Commandments itself. That was its original title. But not many copies of the Book of Commandments survived. I'll tell you that story in a second. And Grandma would probably be grateful for that, because by the time it was republished in 1835, The title had been changed to The Doctrine and Covenants. And there's even some story behind that. Now, the doctrine in The Doctrine and Covenants referred to the lectures on faith, which Joseph Smith and most likely Sidney Rigdon taught to the School of the Prophets in Kirtland. The covenants then referred to the revelations, what had been called the commandments previously. And honestly, I'm so grateful for that change. There are commandments here, but to see them as covenant commandments, These are the covenants God has made with us. And in these revelations, we see his promises to us and the commandments that he gives us in order for us to keep our part of those promises in return. Yes, there are rules in this book, Grandma, but they are instructions for us to be able to keep our covenants with Christ and reassurances that he will always keep his covenants with us. Eventually, the lectures on faith were removed from this book, having not been officially accepted by the church as binding doctrine. And so the doctrine was left out, although thankfully the title remained, because there is incredible doctrine even in these covenants slash commandments as well. Now, how did this book of covenants come about? By the time the church was about a year and a half old, this would be November of 1831, Joseph Smith had received and recorded around 60 revelations, and the saints wanted copies of their own. You see, even the day the church was organized, April 6, 1830, a revelation was given then, this is section 21 of the Doctrine and Covenants, in which Joseph Smith was given five titles. Now, elder and apostle were two of them. Can you guess the other three? Prophet, seer, and... Now, you probably thought revelator, but in section 21, it was translator. And that is how the saints would have seen Joseph Smith. Again, the Book of Mormon was the greatest evidence of his prophetic role, and he had translated it by the gift and power of God. Now, in our mind, we think prophet, seer, and revelator. And honestly, it was these revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants that established Joseph Smith's role as a revelator, a revealer of new scripture, and not simply a translator of ancient scripture. Now, anytime Joseph Smith would would speak for God and put pen to paper, the saints wanted their own copy of it. At one point, Joseph Smith wrote a letter to W.W. Phelps, who was called to publish the church newspaper in Independence, Missouri. And he said to him that the revelations have been snatched from under my hand as soon as given. And with that, we need to go back to November of 1831. There was a conference of elders and high priests that got together to discuss the revelations that Joseph Smith had been receiving. The question on their mind was, what do we do with them? Yes, he's a translator of ancient scripture, but is he a revealer of new scripture? Should we compile these revelations and and publish them as scripture to the world? As they turned to the Lord for confirmation, not only did they get a yes, but they got one better. They received a revelation, now known as section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants, that was meant to be the preface of this book. Only book of scripture that I'm aware of, only book on earth that I know of, that has a divine preface at the beginning. At that conference, they decided to print 10,000 copies, twice the number of the original run of the Book of Mormon, which would have been astounding to anyone. There weren't 10,000 members of the church. And yet to be able to have that kind of optimism, that hope, that zeal to share the word of God with those around them. Eventually they had to pull that number way back because of opposition and lack of funds. But the fact that they wanted to flood the earth with the Doctrine and Covenants tells us something about their appetite for revelation and their understanding of its worth. 
Now, publication began the following year, 1832, with W.W. W. Phelps and his printing press there in Independence, Missouri. And yet by 1833, as it's not yet all put together, a mob comes in to destroy the press, to tar and feather the printers, to scare away the Latter-day Saints. This is where we learn that famous story of church history about those wonderful young women, Mary Elizabeth Rollins and her sister Carolyn, who saw the mob toss the printing press into the street and scatter the type and throw out the pages of the Book of Commandments. And as they saw the pages of Scripture lying there in the street, soon to be destroyed by the mob, they rushed forward. These two teenage sisters, Mary was 15, Carolyn was 13, and gathering as many as they could, they ran from the mob that was pursuing them, hid in a cornfield, hiding the pages under their own bodies. Until the mob left, they found their way to an old deserted cabin that Sister Phelps had run to with her children, gave the pages to her, who returned them to her husband. In fact, Oliver Cowdery took some of those pages that survived and bound them together into a book and gave a copy to Mary Elizabeth Rollins, which I'm sure she treasured right alongside the copy of the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith had given her a few years before. But with so few actual surviving copies of that original Book of Commandments, by 1835, when they were ready to roll out another edition, complete with some additional revelations that had come to Joseph Smith in the meantime, by then they changed the title from Book of Commandments to Doctrine and Covenants. A book intended to join the Bible, Old and New Testament, and the Book of Mormon as canonized scripture for the Church of Christ. Now I want to say something, hopefully briefly, about canonization. Canon comes from a Greek word meaning a rod or a reed, a measuring stick. And that's what canon does. It provides the measuring stick whereby we can judge truth. Does it measure up to what we find in canonized scripture? In Last Latter-day Saints, we usually don't talk about the canon. We call it the standard works. But again, that word standard, it's the standard works because they are the standard for our works the standard whereby we judge our works. Are they in line? Do they measure up to this standard? Now, the fact that the Doctrine and Covenants was canonized, that it became part of that same measuring stick, is important for us to understand. In fact, the timing of the canonization is important as well. Late 1831, what's going on as this conference assembles to discuss the future of these revelations? Do they, do they constitute real scripture? Uh, should they be part of the Latter-day Saint canon? Well, by this time, Kirtland, Ohio is one gathering place and Missouri is becoming another. And so you have Latter-day Saints that are outside the, the direct sphere of influence of Joseph Smith. And though he can't be in two places at once, his revelations can and so by canonizing the Doctrine and Covenants, or Book of Commandments at the time, as scripture, it's a way for Joseph Smith to extend his prophetic reach. Written scripture can do that in ways that the spoken word simply cannot. Second, we start seeing some other people within the church that are kind of vying for authority positions. By then, the Hiram Page story had already taken place. We'll see that in section 28 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Again, with kind of two church headquarters, where does Joseph Smith fit? If he's in Kirtland, are these two separate organizations? Are they on equal footing? Is Joseph Smith still in charge of the church as a whole? And so at a time when other leaders are beginning to exercise influence, canonizing scripture is another chance for Joseph Smith to establish his prophetic authority. He's receiving revelation, canonized scriptural revelation, on a level that no one else in the church is. And thirdly, at the same time period, the first anti-Mormon writings are beginning to appear in a nearby newspaper. Ezra Booth, who had joined the church five months earlier, had apostatized. He'd seen Joseph Smith perform a miracle and joined the church. And then when he found later that he was unable to perform similar miracles himself, he was disillusioned and he left. It reminds me of something a general authority once said, that if someone joins the church because of a miracle, it will be a miracle if they stay. Again, miracles come as a result of our faith, not the other way around. Miracles shouldn't produce faith. Faith should produce miracles. Ezra Booth had the order wrong. And when he apostatized, he began writing letters in that Ohio area that were causing some people to begin questioning Joseph Smith as a prophet of God. 
Sound familiar? This is a problem that's been going on ever since the beginning of the church. So again, by publishing these revelations, compiling them, putting them into a book, putting them in the hands of people, fine, you can read the anti-Mormon letters in the newspaper, or you can read the revelations of Joseph Smith in the Book of Commandments. And compare the two. Compare the spirit you feel from these two. By the way, that's still something you and I can do today. There's so much on the internet that wants to tear Joseph Smith to shreds. Moroni gave him the heads up that it would be that way. His name would be had for good and evil among all nations. And his name for evil is increasing because of a lot of misinformation that's out there. I have read a ton of it. And I remain firm in my testimony that Joseph Smith was a true prophet of the true and living God. And the Doctrine and Covenants is one of the great evidences of that for me. The Book of Mormon is another. But to see this canonized scripture extending his reach, establishing his authority, countering his enemies, it still does that. If you feel far away from Joseph Smith, in, whether in time or in testimony, then study the Doctrine and Covenants. If you feel pulled in all kinds of different directions, wondering which leaders out there to follow, then study the Doctrine and Covenants. And if you feel opposition tearing down your faith in Jesus Christ, in his restored gospel, in his restored church, then study the Doctrine and Covenants. This canonized scripture can do for you what it did for the saints in Joseph Smith's day. You can come to know that God speaks to living prophets as he always has. Now, one other thing to tell you about canonization because the process is fascinating to me. Throughout history, there seem to be four generally agreed upon criteria for canonizing scripture. Apostolicity, which is just a fun word to say, so try to squeeze that into casual conversation. In other words, was it written by a prophet or apostle of God? What's the source? Okay, apostolicity. Orthodoxy is another. Does it agree with the things that have already been established by God in the past? In other words, does this gospel agree with the other established gospels? Does this epistle agree with the doctrine in these other epistles? Uh, there's orthodoxy. Third is Catholicity. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be part of the Catholic Church. Catholic, lowercase c, actually simply means universal. And so, is it meant for everyone out there instead of a specific audience? For example, Paul's letter to the Corinthians was, yes, intended for the Corinthian saints. But every other branch of the church around the Mediterranean could benefit from it. So it had a Catholic message, a universal message for all. And then fourth, and perhaps most important, was traditional use. Did that scripture outlive the age of its own creation? Did future generations still find value, resonance there, that it would continue to speak to their soul, answer their questions? Was it independent, in some ways, of the time that created it? Now, in some ways, the Book of Mormon entered the scene as canonized scripture. It helped create the church, okay? Was it apostolic? Ancient prophets in the New World spoke as moved by the Spirit of God. Was it orthodox? Yes, the teachings of the Book of Mormon agree with the teachings of the Bible. Was it Catholic? Is it universal? Yes, its message is for all. And traditional use? That's a question that you and I still have to answer. How much do we feast upon the words of Christ as found in the Book of Mormon? Now shift to the Doctrine and Covenants. Same kinds of things. Does it pass the test of apostolicity? Was Joseph Smith a true prophet? Well, study these words. Study the Book of Mormon. Find out for yourself. Is it orthodox? Does it pass that test? Study the Doctrine and Covenants and compare it to what you already know from the Bible. You'll be amazed at, at the, the cloud of witnesses that Joseph Smith is a part of, that these words so beautifully mesh with the words of ancient prophets and apostles. Third, does it pass the test of Catholicity? Does it have a universal message? We'll actually see in section one just how universal this message is meant to be. And frequently throughout the Doctrine and Covenants, at least half a dozen times, the Lord will say, what I say unto you, I say unto all. Some of these revelations seem very specific in terms of an audience of one. And yet, it is meant for all of us. And I hope that we'll be able to bring that to light throughout this year. And fourth, uh, 
traditional use. Again, that's on us. Are we studying the doctrine and covenants? Does it inform the covenants that we are trying to make and keep with the Lord? Now, there's one other thing I want to say about canonization before we move on. Because in my opinion, the Doctrine and Covenants provides us such an incredible case study of the process. It actually helps us make better sense of how the Bible came about. And it has to do with what I call shifts of authority that take you from Revelation, which make, is so obvious in the Doctrine and Covenants, from Revelation to Scripture and from Scripture to canon. Now, that might all seem synonymous, but it isn't. Revelation, there's a shift of authority there that goes from God to a human representative. God is speaking to his prophet or apostle. There is a shift of authority from heaven to earth. That, that's what we find in Revelation. But will Revelation become Scripture? Not necessarily. Again, that initial revelation to the prophet or apostle, or even to you or me, might not be meant for everyone. And if it's simply individual revelation rather than institutional revelation, then it stops right there. Does it need to be written down and spread to others? Maybe, maybe not. Now, if it goes from that oral or inner kind of communication into written scripture, then the authority has shifted again. The first shift was from heaven to earth, God to man. The second shift is from that human representative to an actual text. It's not the momentary experience of hearing the Word of God spoken by someone moved upon by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now it is written form. There's a, there's a whole scholarship out there on the difference between literacy and orality. And orality is this in-the-moment kind of an experience, whereas once it's written down, it can be studied and poured over. It can be cross-referenced and analyzed. And that's one of the things that, that ha takes place, that shift of authority from a person to a text. Is it revelation? Yes. Well, now it's scripture. Now, the third shift of authority is when it goes from scripture to canon. Now, canon is still written scripture, but now it gets into the hands of a community of saints that has gathered around that scriptural text and is keeping it alive generation after generation after generation. In that case, this shift of authority goes in part from the text to the community, the body of believers that continues to invest that text with meaning. And you see how these shifts of authority coincide with the four criteria for canon? They almost seem to constitute what I would call stages of authorization. You have these shifts of authority, but they happen in stages. The first one, from heaven to earth, there's revelation. And what criteria does that establish? Apostolicity. This is a true messenger from God. The second shift from Revelation to Scripture, now it's written down. And is this text orthodox, and is it meant for everyone? Does it pass the criteria, pass the tests of orthodoxy and Catholicity? And then the third stage of authorization, as it shifts from Scripture to canon, that's where you see the criteria of traditional use. Is there a community of saints, a body of believers, that is keeping that Scripture alive and well? And again, that's where you and I come in. Some questions you could be asking to see if something will pass through these stages of authorization. It's like a, a spectrum from individual inspiration on one side to institutional revelation on the other. Is this message from God? Allow the Holy Ghost to, to confirm that to your heart. Is it meant to be recorded? Is it meant for others? Should it govern our lives? Or another way to ask those questions, is it true? Is it timely? Is it timeless? And as I have studied scripture for almost my entire life, I testify that the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, those are my standard works. That is canon because they are true. They are timely and they are timeless. One of my biggest hopes for this year is that you'll see just how timeless the Doctrine and Covenants is. That those revelations received by Joseph Smith and others that have been translated into Scripture, written down, recorded, and are now available for our constant traditional use, that it's worth it, that it deserves our rapt attention, our serious study. Now, years ago when I was teaching institute in Tennessee, it happened to be a Doctrine and Covenants class, and several of my students brought a non-member friend with them. 
Now that happened all the time. It was a great missionary opportunity. But for some reason that time, I just, I wondered, how is this person going to relate to 19th century American scripture that she's completely unfamiliar with? And I was so struck by her comment after class. She came up to me and thanked me for the lesson. And she said, you know, this lesson was incredibly, and then I was just waiting for the adjective. What's she going to say? Her adjective surprised me. She said, this lesson was incredibly relevant. I don't know if I'd ever had a better compliment that in scripture meant for another time and another place, this young woman, not even a member of our church, found relevance to the situation she found herself in. These words, revealed to Joseph Smith in the 1800s, recorded way back then, but kept alive in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, resonated with the soul of this sweet sister. She saw that it spoke to her situation in her day. And I pray that that will be the experience for each of us, every lesson that we study this year in the Doctrine and Covenants. What he says unto one, he says unto all. In fact, at that conference in November of 1831, listen to what they said about this book of scripture that was being produced. Keep an eye out for the criteria of canonicity. They hailed the revelations as the foundation of the church in these last days. There's orthodoxy. And a benefit to the world. There's Catholicity. Showing that the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom of our Savior are again entrusted to man. There's apostolicity. And the riches of eternity within the compass of those who are willing to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There is traditional use. Are we willing to live by every word, specifically these words in the Doctrine and Covenants? I had a bishop years ago that I swear had the Doctrine and Covenants memorized. When my wife and I were first married, we moved into a married student ward down at BYU. And our first bishop was Ron Hershey. Bishop Hershey and his wife changed our lives as we served in their ward. And when I was called to be his counselor, in practically every bishopric meeting, in every ward council meeting, he was constantly not just running the affairs of our ward, but trying to teach us how to run the church, trying to prepare us to become generations of leaders later on. And I was amazed at how often he quoted the Doctrine and Covenants. Of course, he loved all scripture, but for some reason, that's what stood out to me. In practically every training, it was some Doctrine and Covenants verse that came to his mind. It taught me something. That if you're teaching people how to lead or how to serve, if you're teaching people how the church is supposed to run, then turn to the Doctrine and Covenants. I'll also add Bishop Hershey's greatest message for us during those years of his bishopric was faith. He taught it constantly from the pulpit in meetings and interviews. He was trying to help us build an unshaken faith as we began our marriages. And again, he taught from the Doctrine and Covenants constantly. Of course, the Book of Mormon remains the keystone of our religion, but the Doctrine and Covenants has been called the capstone. And as President Benson has taught, if the Book of Mormon brings us to Christ, the Doctrine and Covenants brings us to his church and kingdom. It ratifies and fortifies the message of all scripture that went before it. Most importantly, it confirms our faith in Christ. It shows that he is the head of the church in our day as well. Rewind my personal clock a little, and let me take you back to the last area of my mission. We were teaching a family that was so Catholic. When we taught the third discussion, which was about the apostasy, it did not go over well. The father paused us and ran next door to get his mom to come over. She was a secretary for the Catholic priest in the area, taught catechism and so on. And, and she came over with this stack of Catholic encyclopedias and slammed them on the table in front of us and said, you show me the break in the chain. I thought, wow, this is not going the way that we'd hoped. Well, we, we left after the third discussion with our tail between our legs. And I remember my companion asking, what are we going to do next time? They're not ready for the fourth discussion. They don't believe in, in, in the restoration that we've taught before and, and the need for it based on the apostasy in that last lesson. And I said, well, let's teach the fourth lesson anyway, but let's do it a little bit differently. The fourth discussion back in those days was where it all came together, the, some of the most meaningful doctrines we ever got to teach eternal families, work for the dead, degrees of glory. And I remember when we typically taught it, it was almost like we were hiding behind a few relatively obscure verses from the Bible, just in hopes of helping them see, see, it's in there. 
we would teach baptisms for the dead and just cling to 1 Corinthians 15, 29. See, it's mentioned. We would teach degrees of glory and cling to 1 Corinthians 15, 40 to 42. See, some of the, the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars. We teach the redemption of the dead and cling to those verses in 1 Peter 3 and 4 about this preaching to the spirits in prison. Or we teach eternal families and cling to the verse in 1 Corinthians 11, 11 about neither the man nor the woman without each other in the Lord. And it hit me. And sad to say, this was the last area in my mission. I, I wish I would have learned this two years earlier. That we don't believe those doctrines simply because they're in the Bible. Joseph Smith wasn't studying the New Testament and stumbled across these obscure passages and somehow blew them up into doctrines and principles and practices and theology that had been lost for 1800 years. No. It came by revelation and was recorded in Scripture and became canonized truth to us. It was a restoration, and it had to be, because those truths were lost during the days of the apostasy. When we went back to this Catholic family and taught the fourth discussion, it was no longer trying to proof text it with these passages from the letters of Paul. We boldly taught baptisms for the dead, and we almost excused Paul for having mentioned it. We let him know, we let our, these investigators know, there's not, yes, it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. But it's such an obscure passage and there's not enough to explain it there for us to really understand the doctrine. Otherwise, every Christian church would still be practicing baptisms for the dead as it was practiced during the days of Paul. But no one does. Do you know why? Because that truth was lost during the apostasy. I know that's not what you, what you want to hear, but there was an apostasy and there has been a restoration. If you want to understand baptisms for the dead, don't read 1 Corinthians 15:29. Read Doctrine and Covenants 127 and 128. If you want to understand the degrees of glory, yeah, you can see it hinted at in 1 Corinthians 15, 40 to 42, but not enough to recreate the doctrine. You want that? You're going to have to turn to Joseph Smith and the Doctrine and Covenants and study section 76. You want to know eternal families? We did not cobble that doctrine together based on 1 Corinthians 11, 11. It was revealed from God to his prophet Joseph Smith as part of the restoration of all things, and you can study it in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 132. The redemption of the dead? I'm so grateful Peter preserved some hints that he knew that doctrine was true as well. But if you want to understand it, don't go to the letters of Peter. Go to the Doctrine and Covenants and study section 138. Did you catch the book of Scripture I kept referring this family to? As missionaries, we teach the Book of Mormon all the time. We hardly ever teach the Doctrine and Covenants. And yet it came so clearly to me as I was trying to help this Catholic family understand apostasy in order to understand the need for restoration, that it was restoration that revealed these things. Joseph Smith was not taking obscure passages and blowing them up back into true doctrine. He was receiving these things and revealing these things and recording these truths in the Doctrine and Covenants. This book restores lost truth. It shows the world that God speaks again as he spoke anciently. It shows that God is as interested now as he ever was anciently in keeping his promises. It is the new and everlasting covenant after all. New as in final dispensation, doctrine and covenants. Everlasting as in all the way through, Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon. It is a new and everlasting covenant and the Lord intends to keep it. The doctrine and covenants is evidence of that. It gives us a chance to see him keeping his word, preparing the earth for the second coming gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. The Doctrine and Covenants gives you a chance to watch the kingdom of God roll forth, line upon line and precept upon precept. The first year I was going to teach the Doctrine and Covenants in seminary, I'd studied it several times before, but I wanted it to be fresh in my mind and full in my heart. And so I reread it the day before seminary started. We were going to start on a Monday, and so that Sunday, from sunup to sundown, I poured over the Doctrine and Covenants. 294 pages, start to finish. And honestly, it was like watching time-lapse photography of a, plant, a flower bloom, a plant grow, but this time it was the kingdom of God. And watching that seed get planted 
and fertilized and expand. It was an incredible experience to see change over time. The revelations tend to get longer and deeper. The way God refers to Joseph Smith changes over time. Even the way the Lord approaches his saints and, and starts to shift the center of gravity from inspiration towards agency. It's an amazing process to watch unfold. And I'm really excited to watch it unfold with you this year. Now, like I said, it all begins in section one. Not the first section chronologically, but the first that God wanted us to read as we begin studying this book of Scripture. It is his preface to his book of commandments. He actually says that in verse 6. This is my preface unto the book of my commandments. And as with any good preface, it's what the writer wants us to know about all that will follow. What he wants us to know first and foremost. A preface or an introduction is often where you'll see a thesis statement letting us know what this book is for. And sure enough, there's a thesis statement in section one also. But what amazes me first in this revelation is the very first word of what is meant to be this very first section. Now, if you went through the books of scripture in the standard works, I'll bet you know a lot of the first words. What's the first word of the Old Testament? Think about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How about the first word in the Book of Mormon? Very famous. You know that one? I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. What's the first word in the New Testament? You know that one? Now, if you started with John, he's channeling his inner Genesis, and so it's in the beginning also. But that's not how Matthew begins. First word in the New Testament? The. Sorry, it's not very exciting. The book of the genealogy of Jesus. How about the Pearl of Great Price? First word? Again, just the. The words of God that he spake unto Moses. But of all the books of Scripture, the Doctrine and Covenants has my very favorite first word. It speaks volumes because it speaks at all. The first word of the Doctrine and Covenants is hearken, which seems to combine the sense of listening and doing together. Hearken, listen, get ready to act. I'm giving instruction, commandment, doctrine, covenant. I'm speaking again. Do you have any idea what that word would have meant to the Lord who spoke it? For the last 1800 years, he had been muzzled by a Christianity that no longer believed that he continued to speak. This is God breaking the silence of nearly two millennia, I can talk, hearken to my words. The heavens have not been closed. I still speak. I care about my children. And one of the greatest things I can do for them is to speak to them through prophets and apostles. Enoch is famous for revealing that earth-shattering truth that we believe in a God who weeps. Well, the preface of the Doctrine and Covenants reminds us of something that shouldn't have been as earth-shattering as it is, that we believe in a God who speaks as well. Now, that would have been obvious to the people of the Old Testament and the New Testament, but it was no longer obvious in Joseph Smith's day. A very famous contemporary of his, Ralph Waldo Emerson, graduated from Harvard and in 1838 was invited back to his alma mater to speak at the Divinity School. Now here's Emerson addressing a bunch of ministers in training, the, the clergy of his day. But what he taught that day was so earth-shaking, so unorthodox, that they never invited him back. He said this, The assumption that the age of inspiration is past, that the Bible is closed, indicates with sufficient clearness the falsehood of our theology. It is the office of a true teacher to show us that God is, not was, that he speaketh, not spake. Do you understand the power of those verb tenses? The way they viewed the Bible was a God who was trapped in ancient scripture, unable to speak beyond or outside of its pages. That was a God who was. But what about the God who is? That was a God who spake. But what about the God who speaks? Later in that address, Emerson said, I look for the hour when that supreme beauty, 
which ravished the souls of those Eastern men, and chiefly of those Hebrews, and through their lips spoke oracles to all time, shall speak in the West also. Now there's a lot in Emerson's Divinity School address that I don't agree with. But what he taught there is so powerful and so true. To long for those days where the beauty which ravished ancient prophets awakens living prophets in our day. Ironically, it was happening in his day. God was speaking again, and he was addressing the world with that first opening note. Hearken. He says that word or similar words so often in these first few verses. Hearken and voice and hearken and listen and voice and ear and hear and voice and mouth. This is not the God without body parts or passions that the creed had confined to ancient text. This is a living Lord, a speaking Savior. Shifting from Emerson's Divinity School experience to my own, I remember in one particular class we were studying the Bible throughout American history. And there was this focus on this phrase, ad fontis in Latin. It means to the sources or back to the fount, ad fontis. Uh, uh, Erasmus, the great Renaissance humanist, made such a focus on that. We have to get back to the original sources. And there were a lot of people in Joseph Smith's own time period that were interested in the same thing. Alexander Campbell was a good one, for example. That we have to get back to using Bible words for Bible things. That there's this Bible onlyism. We've got to get back to the source itself. And for them, the source was Scripture. For centuries, there have been attempts. How do we get back to the earliest possible manuscripts? We've got to get back to the sources themselves. And in that class, it kept hitting me. And in fact, my professor pointed it out. As far back as they'd go, there was still one last leap that no one seemed willing to take. I don't even know if it even crossed their minds. Because to get back to Scripture is still one step removed from revelation. Remember these stages of authorization. The initial revelation, which brings us back to God. God speaking to his servants. Revelation taking place. Not just get back to Scripture, get back to the source of Scripture itself, which is a God who speaks. I love that phrase in the introduction to the Doctrine and Covenants that says that in these words we hear the tender but firm voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking anew in the dispensation of the fullness of times. You will hear both his tenderness and his firmness. You'll see him introducing himself with so many of his different metaphorical names. So often the way he introduces himself at the beginning of a revelation is the way he wants us to hear his voice in the words that follow. It was always fun for me at Divinity School, surrounded by ministers in training, to compare Bibles. They always looked at mine like in shock, like, how come your Bible is so much bigger than ours is? And I'm like, well, we've added a few additional books. They were kind of scandalized by that. But what I loved about some of their Bibles, particularly some of the Protestant Bibles I saw, is what they call a red letter edition, where you open it up in the New Testament, and every time it was Jesus speaking directly, those words are in red. Just bold, jump off the page at you. What's fun to think of the Doctrine and Covenants, it would essentially be an all red book. This is the voice of the Lord. He is speaking and he wants us to hearken. Elder Neil Maxwell once called the Doctrine and Covenants the modern equivalent of the thundering directness of Sinai. Do you sense that in the very first word? The thundering directness. I am speaking to you. So listen, hearken. One of the great scholars of early American history that also happens to be an incredibly faithful Latter-day Saint, is Richard Bushman, former history professor at Columbia University, award-winning from three different sources. Listen to what Dr. Bushman has said. At some level, Joseph's revelations indicate a loss of trust in the Christian ministry. For all their learning and their eloquence, the clergy could not be trusted with the Bible. They didn't understand what the book meant. It was a record of revelations, that first step back to the source, And the ministry had turned it into a handbook. The Bible had become a text to be interpreted rather than an experience to be lived. In the process, the power of the book was lost. 
To me, that is Joseph Smith's significance for our time. His life posed the question, do you believe God speaks? His mission was to hold out for the reality of divine revelation and establish one small outpost where that principle survived. Joseph's revelatory principle is not a single revelation serving for all time, nor a mild sort of inspiration seeping into the minds of all good people. It was specific, ongoing directions from God to his people. Revelation to scripture to canon. God to man, man to text, text to community of believers. This was biblical time started anew in this final dispensation. Elsewhere, Bushman said this, the striking feature of Joseph Smith's classic revelations is the purity of God's voice coming out of the heavens and demanding our attention. From the first word, and I would put that literally here, this first word, hearken. From the first word, a relationship is put in place. God speaks to command or inform. We listen. The voice is pure in that God alone is speaking. Joseph Smith, whom we know actually dictated the revelation, is totally absent from the rhetorical space. In fact, in some of the revelations we'll see shortly, Joseph Smith is being addressed and not very kindly at times. If this was me speaking to myself, I think I'd be a little more gentle. But when the Lord is addressing his servant, even when it's coming out of that servant's mouth back into his ears, it's the firm voice and not just the tender one that he heard. One last statement from Bushman. In virtually all the revelations, the voice is imperious, but never argumentative. The words make no appeal to reason or scripture or experience. They didn't have to. This is the Lord speaking. Remember what shocked Jesus' initial hearers? He spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes. He doesn't just have to quote ancient scripture. That's, that's scribal religion. This was prophetic religion. Bushman continues, God pronounces what is and what will be without giving evidence. Hearers must decide to believe or not without reference to outside authority. Not common sense, not science, not the Bible, not tradition, not anything. The hearer faces the personage who speaks, free to hearken or turn away. Sadly, there were those in his day and still those in our own who turn away. But thankfully, there are also those then and now who hearken, who follow that first inspired word from a God who chooses to address us. Now, please don't misunderstand me. God was not giving the earth the silent treatment throughout the years of apostasy, not as far as individuals were concerned. God has always been present to answer prayers, to give comfort, to speak peace to the soul. I am so grateful for the inspiration among so many of Catholicism's and Protestantism's leaders throughout history. But there is a difference between individual inspiration and institutional revelation. Revelation to scripture to canon. The fact that the Bible was closed, encapsulated, so to speak, that there's a back cover on it, lets us know that this process had come to a screeching halt. There were no more apostles. So what chance does anything have to pass the test of apostolicity? Only the things that were written earlier by prophets and apostles during biblical days. But biblical days have returned to us. And the first word of the Doctrine and Covenants is meant to rivet our attention. It is meant to capture our ears so that we hearken to the voice of the Lord. Now, I promise I won't spend this much time on every word of this section, but that first one is breathtaking. In fact, if you ever want an interesting study, study section 1 and section 133 simultaneously. Because at that same November 1831 conference that section 1 was given as the preface, what has since become section 133 was given as the appendix. The bookends of this book of scripture were given at that same time this one has always been number, section one from that point forward, and the appendix keeps getting pu pushed back further and further as additional revelations were inserted. But how does section 133 begin? You can probably guess. First word of section 133, hearken. In fact, almost at random, you could open up to any section of the Doctrine and Covenants, and more likely than not, 
in the very first verse, you would find some word like hearken or listen or hear or voice. I love how emphatic the Lord is that he is speaking to us again, institutionally and not just individually. There's so many other incredible parallels between 1 and 133. It's amazing to study those in tandem. Maybe we'll do that when we get to section 133, probably in December or something. But back to section 1, verse 1. All these hearken, voice, hearken, listen, voice words in the first few verses are addressed to whom? Notice this. Hearken, first of all, O ye people of my church. And who's speaking to them? saith the voice of him who dwells on high and whose eyes are upon all men. So trust what I say because you ought to trust what I see. I dwell on high, higher perspective. That's why we talk about watchmen on the tower, right? That elevation gives greater perspective and visibility. Well, imagine the divine angle, the, the, the heavenly elevation. He who dwells on high, he whose eyes are upon all men. I see the big picture. I see you. So please listen to me. You wouldn't think that God would have to establish his credentials in the very first sentence. But after all these years of apostasy, perhaps he felt that need. And first to the church, and then quickly expands it, almost immediately. Same breath, same verse at least. Yea, verily I say, hearken, and now the expanded audience, ye people from afar, ye that are upon the isles of the sea, listen together. So my church first, but only as a means of addressing ultimately all of God's children. Remember we talked about this in the Book of Mormon last year, that there is this contrary to be proven between exclusivity and inclusivity. God does play favorites, and yet he is no respecter of persons. Now, how does he do both of those at the same time? He chooses a chosen people, his church, but he chooses them with the mission to go and choose everyone else. This is exclusivity in pursuit of inclusivity. This is the Abrahamic covenant. In thee and in thy seed, exclusivity, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Radical inclusivity. So I'm speaking to you, my church, so that in the next breath I can address everyone. It's up to you to make sure the water gets to the end of the row. You who have been warned, warn your neighbor. Verse 2, verily the voice of the Lord is unto all men. There is none to escape. Do you sense this inclusivity, the universality of this message? This is Catholicity speaking, okay? The universal church, all of God's children. He goes on in verse 2, there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated. There is no escaping the all-encompassing voice of God. Do you remember what Isaiah said about these three body parts? The same three mentioned here in section 1, verse 2. The eye, the ear, and the heart. Back in Isaiah chapter 6, and this is something Jesus quotes in his ministry, something that Paul quotes in his ministry. They're seeing the same problem generation after generation. And it's what Isaiah described as fat hearts, heavy ears, and shut eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and convert and be healed. It's amazing how much the adversary does to try to close our eyes, to plug our ears, to harden our hearts so that we can't see or hear or feel the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember what King Benjamin said as he assembled his people for that great final address? He warned them, I didn't bring you here to trifle with my words. I want you to hearken unto me. Same word, hearken, listen and prepare to do. And open your ears that you may hear, and your hearts that you may understand, and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. So he said mind, but this view, this I. You see what the Doctrine and Covenants is meant to accomplish? To reverse the hardening of heart and closing of eye and plugging of ear that's taken place in Isaiah's day and Jesus' day and Paul's day and throughout the apostasy. Wake up the world. God is speaking again. And what is he saying? Look at verse 4. The voice of warning shall be unto all people. 
What's he warning them about? Go back to verse 3. He's warning them that the rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow. He's warning them that their iniquity shall be spoken upon the housetops. He's warning them that their secret acts shall be revealed. There is no cloak to cover your sin. There are only the robes of righteousness that the Lord is offering us. So again, what is the voice of warning saying? It's pleading with us to repent, to become clean. Now back to verse 4. How is this voice of warning coming? Again, the ultimate audience is all people. The universal reach of the restoration. It's supposed to go to everyone who's ever lived. But how does it start? It starts with his own disciples. Do you catch that in four? The voice of warning shall be unto all people. But how? By the mouths of my disciples, whom I have chosen in these last days. I chose them because they chose me. And in choosing to be chosen, I'm now sending them forth to choose everyone else to be chosen as well. Verse 5, they shall go forth. None shall stay them. That ought to comfort every struggling missionary, every overwhelmed Relief Society president, every disciple of Jesus Christ called upon by God to share the voice of warning. You can't be stopped, at least not from the outside. You can only stop yourself. No unhallowed hand will stop the work from progressing. Why? Because the Lord said so. End of verse 5, I, the Lord, have commanded them. And remember what Nephi assures us about the commandments of God. He always provides a way to accomplish them. That's his promise and his power. Or as he says in verse 6, it's his authority. This is mine authority and the authority of my servants and my preface unto the book of my commandments. Again, the first words he wants us to hear and feel as we open this dispensation which I have given them to publish unto you, O inhabitants of the earth. Now pay close attention to the pronouns there. Because in these last six verses, we keep kind of bouncing back and forth between the the exclusive and the inclusive. The my church versus all people in the isles of the sea. The my disciples versus all men. And notice the focus here. I have given them to publish unto you, O inhabitants of the earth. Now, them is a third person pronoun, and you is a second person pronoun. Them is, they're off in some other room. I'm just talking about them. But you, I'm in the room with you. I'm speaking directly to you. Now, I think we would assume, as members of the church, that he's probably in our room, right? Jesus is here with us among the church members, telling us, you need to go teach them. You need to go teach the rest of the world. But that's not how he says it in verse 6. As he begins the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord places himself in the other room, in the room with all the inhabitants of the earth, and he's giving them the heads up. I'm going to speak again. I'm going to call prophets and apostles as I did anciently. I'm going to reveal truth which will become scripture and eventually canon if you'll just use it. But I'm going to establish a church, and I'm going to give this book to them those church members in the other room so that they can then publish it unto you, O inhabitants of the earth. You see who he's with and who he's speaking most directly to? There's the universality of this message. I wish I would have understood this as a missionary. I would have knocked on their doors and said, "Um, I I am so sorry, but I have something that was actually intended for you. I don't know how it came to me first, but I've been holding on to this all these years, and I I just realized that (laughs) it was actually addressed to you directly. Please forgive me for taking so long to give you your book. It was only given to me to be delivered to you. Now, once they open the book, what are they going to see? Or better said, what are they going to hear? They're going to hear that voice of warning telling them they need to repent or all these things are going to take place. He gets back to that in verse 7. Wherefore, fear and tremble. You sense why there's a warning that's needed? Fear and tremble, O ye people, for what I, the Lord, have decreed in them shall be fulfilled. He'll reiterate that at the end of this section. 
Then in verse 8, Verily I say unto you that they who go forth, again, they, those other guys, the church members in that other room, again, he's almost taking for granted, well, of course they'll have the book. I mean, they're members of the church. They're my disciples in the last day. They hearkened first. But they better be getting this word out to the rest. They who go forth, bearing these tidings unto the inhabitants of the earth, the ultimate audience, to them is power given to seal both on earth and in heaven. Now, what kind of sealing is going on here? We're not talking about sealing families together. That's a revelation yet to come. Give it a few more years. But here he speaks of sealing the unbelieving and rebellious. In verse 9, he speaks of sealing them up unto the day when the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the wicked without measure. I told you this was a voice of warning. If you don't repent, the wrath of God will be poured out. Your iniquities will be spoken from the housetops you will be sealed up unto damnation as opposed to being sealed up unto salvation. Do you remember in the book of Revelation, as the cataclysmic events before the coming of Christ are taking place, and these angels, these destroying angels are about to be let loose upon the earth, and yet they're held back for a moment so that the servants of God can seal people up unto salvation. This is Revelation 7 verse 3, they're told, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now that talk of being sealed in the forehead reminds me of the, the dress uniform of the ancient high priests. That is part of their priestly robes, part of their temple garments. They had this hat, they called it a mitre, and on the forehead was a plate of gold upon which were engraven the words, holiness to the Lord. Can you think of anywhere else you've seen that engraven in gold? Is that always on your mind? Has it been sealed in your forehead? As opposed to what you'll see later in the book of Revelation, the wicked that have something else on their minds, the 666, the mark of the beast in their foreheads, just shy of 777, which would have been a number of perfection, falling just short of that, this counterfeit Christ, Lucifer himself. What's on your mind? What mark is on your forehead? What are you sealed up unto? Salvation or damnation? God or the adversary? Zion or Babylon? We are making that decision constantly. Planting seeds that will eventually bear fruit for either good or ill. This is the law of the harvest and it's described in verse 10. The day when the Lord shall come to recompense unto every man according to his work and measure to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow man. Interesting that he would emphasize that horizontal component, that second great commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. What have you measured out to your fellow man? It's going to come back to you. You can bank on it. That has been signed and sealed and delivered. And the only way to get around it, if you've sent out negativity, is again through repentance. This is the law of the harvest. This is the yo-yo principle. What you send out comes right back to you. Call it karma, if you will. But that is what the Lord is warning them about. The second coming is a day of reckoning and recompense, of reward or punishment. In some ways, section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants is so much like chapter 9 and 10 of 3rd Nephi. Shortly before the coming of Christ to the Nephites in 3rd Nephi 11, you hear a voice from heaven, chastening them for their sins, calling them to greater repentance. It's exactly what's happening here. No wonder the voice of the Lord has to come. That's what he says in verse 11. Wherefore, in other words, because of all that I've just said, so here's the consequence, because the day of reckoning and recompense is on its way, wherefore the voice of the Lord is unto the ends of the earth, that all that will hear may hear. There's the universality again, the Catholicity, the voice of God to all people, the ends of the earth, the isles of the sea, starting with the church to get the water to the end of the row. If you want to hear, if you are willing to hear, then you can, you may just come and open your ears and open your eyes towards the voice that is calling. That's 3rd Nephi 11, right? And then once you are finally able to understand it, it is God speaking to you and introducing you to his son.
That's what's happening here as well. That all leads up to verse 12, which is the thesis statement of the Doctrine and Covenants. Remember in the Book of Mormon, we saw the thesis statement right at the end of chapter 1 of 1 Nephi? That Nephi's purpose in writing was to show unto all of us that the tender mercies of the Lord were unto all those whom God had chosen because of their faith to make them mighty unto the power of deliverance. There's something similar here. He's trying to make us mighty unto the power of deliverance from our own sins, of preparation for the coming of Christ. Notice what he says in verse 12. Thesis statement. All that we're about to read this year. Prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come. For the Lord is nigh. Christ is coming. And he's coming soon. This is the church of Jesus Christ of latter day saints. We'll see repeatedly throughout the Doctrine and Covenants just how imminent this return is. Remember, this is the voice in 3 Nephi 9 and 10, anticipating the coming of Christ in 11. Remember, this is Revelation, sealing the foreheads of the faithful so that Christ can come. He wants us to be prepared for it. He wants us to repent of our sins so that it can be a great rather than a dreadful day of the Lord. In fact, I'm sure I'll do this again when we get to section 133. But because that's so far away, and because these bookends were received on the same day, can I show you the shortest verse in all of Scripture? Now, most people say that that's the one in John chapter 11, with Mary and Martha and Jesus and Lazarus having having passed away, when Jesus wept. But that has two words in it. And the shortest verse in all Scripture only has one. And it's in section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants. If you go there and see in the appendix of the Doctrine and Covenants, this is the one word God wants us to hear. It's what he's trying to get us prepared to do with the prepare ye, prepare ye for the coming of the Lord is nigh. It's what the voice of warning is trying to wake us up to throughout this revelation. And it's in section 133, verse 16. Now, I know, you'll look at it and go, wait a minute, that has way more words than one. Technically, yes, it has like 30-something. But everything about it is just introduction to the one word that matters. Notice how it begins, 133 verse 16. Hearken and hear, O ye inhabitants of the earth, listen, ye elders of my church, together, and hear the voice of the Lord. So far, all he's doing is clearing the throat, okay? I have a message for you. So hearken, hear. Listen, all of you, elders of the church, all of the inhabitants of the earth, he's doing the same thing he did at the beginning of section 1. In some ways, section 133, verse 16, is a one-verse summary of everything he's trying to accomplish in the preface, section 1. So he's just getting our attention. Hearken, hear, listen up, all you inhabitants of the earth, listen, you elders of the church, hear the voice of the Lord. He calleth upon all men, he commandeth all men everywhere, You see, he hasn't actually said anything yet. Everything he's done thus far in this verse is just to get our attention. Listen up. What's the last word? The only real word of command in this verse. Repent. Please listen to me so that you'll repent. Hearken. Listen and do. Do what? Repent of your sins. Prepare for the coming of Christ. How? Repent. Why? So that your iniquities aren't spoken from the housetops. So you don't have to be sealed unto damnation. You can be sealed up unto salvation. That the day will be a glorious day for you and for Christ as he returns to those who have been waiting and preparing for him. Wise virgins all who have prepared themselves by repenting of their iniquity. It's what Jesus made possible when he left. That's what the atonement and the crucifixion and the resurrection were all for. And when he comes again, second coming, can't you picture that that's what he'll be watching for? Did you do what I gave you the opportunity to do with my departure, with my return? Have you repented? Are you prepared for my coming? There is no greater way to prepare than to repent and to cry repentance so that all the world can be prepared for the coming of Christ as well. We get back to that voice of warning in verse 13, warning us that the anger of the Lord is kindled. Interesting word there. Kindled. There is a fire that's beginning to burn. 
Remember what Joseph Smith said, Noah came before the flood, but I have come before the fire, this day of cleansing with the second coming. That is kindled. His sword is bathed in heaven. In other words, it's unsheathed. It's ready to fall. And what is the sword of the Lord? Armor of God lets us know it is the sword of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And both are forthcoming. God is speaking again. The Word has come. Hearken to it. That ties it into the kindling as well. The Spirit of God like a fire is burning. And that fire, which not only consumes but can cleanse, that sword, which not only cuts but also protects, it's a two-edged sword, as Nephi said back in 1 Nephi 14, 7. It destroys the wicked, but also protects the righteous. That sword shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. No wonder the word of warning has to go to all of them. Verse 14, the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. And what's in that arm? The sword of the Lord. The day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord... And then he makes that first shift of authority I mentioned, from heaven to earth, from God to his servants. Revelation is taking place. Those who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. Cut off by what? Cut off by the sword that he just mentioned in the previous verse. And what's the sword? The word of God. Do you see how the word separates those who will listen from those who will not? And those who refuse to listen to the voice of God, whether by him or by his servants, they cut themselves off by that sword. That is the curse. The curse of the Lamanites, the curse of the Amlicites, the curse of the Jaredites, the curse of any people that have refused to hearken to the voice of God, crying repentance. They have cut themselves off, and it's the word they've ignored that separates them from all that could have been theirs if they had simply been willing to hear. All those who will hear, may hear. Just listen, heed, hearken, so that you'll be prepared for my coming. Why so insistent? You get this sense so far? All of these voice hear, hearken, heed, and warning in order to repent? Because here's what we need to repent of. Verse 15, collectively, they have strayed from mine ordinances, and have broken mine everlasting covenant. Mine ordinances, those channels of divine grace, those checkpoints along the covenant path, and you have strayed from them. Those are the things that mark the path so that you know you're on the path of covenant, and you've strayed. Outside of that straight and narrow, outside of that Goldilocks zone, some have strayed towards too hot, and others have strayed towards too cold. The ordinance of baptism, for example, strain from that ordinance. Some too hot bend towards infant baptism. The baptism is so absolutely essential that even children that are alive in Christ, remember we studied this in Moroni chapter 8, that they absolutely have to have it or they're damned forever. That's too hot. Or stray from the ordinance towards too cold, where baptism, uh, take it or leave it, it's not a required thing. It's a work and we're just here for grace. Or how about strain from the ordinance of the sacrament? either too hot or too cold. Too hot in the direction of transubstantiation, where the emblems are literally transformed into the body and blood of Christ. But is that any worse than strain from the ordinance in the direction of too cold, where there's no transformation whatsoever, not in the life of the person that is participating in that ordinance? How about strain from the ordinance of priesthood ordination, either to make it so selective that there is only a a certain priesthood meant for a clergyman alone, a professional clergy, or strain in the opposite direction, where the priesthood is so diluted and watered down that it is a, a priesthood of all believers, so they say, but without any real priesthood. Protestantism needing to come up with a different kind of authorization, having cut themselves off from any claims of apostolic authority through the Catholic Church. You see, in either direction that history is pulling people, they are strained from the ordinance and need to be brought back to the covenant path. Or the second half of that verse, they have broken my everlasting covenant. If something's broken, it no longer works the way it's supposed to. And for God's covenant to work, it has to be gathering the Israel on both sides of the veil. It has to be spreading the word. Again, on opposite sides of the straight and narrow, there were some that were erring on the side of exclusivity, were the only truth, and were not sharing it with others. 
while others were erring on the side of inclusivity, to the point that there is no difference between us and them which leaves us with nothing to offer them. God's covenant is to choose a people who then choose everyone else. We've already seen that several times in this short revelation. Now, without the ordinances and without an understanding of the covenant, what ends up naturally happening, verse 16, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness. Righteousness established through ordinances and covenants. And what are you left with instead? Well, without God's righteousness, all you're left with is trying to claim your own. Every man walketh in his own way instead of the straight and narrow way. They walk after the image of his own God because they no longer recognize in themselves the image of the true God. The world has set up the altar that Paul talked about in Acts 17, the altar to the unknown God, or perhaps even worse, it's a known God, but it's no God at all. It's themselves. Next phrase, the image of man's own God is in the likeness of the world, whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon. Now here's his first metaphor for the wicked world. The world he's trying to warn us out of. Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. Again, he's trying to coax us out of the great and spacious building. Another great thing that shall fall, and great shall be the fall of it. That's an element that comes up loud and clear in section 133, the appendix. Come out of Babylon, be clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, flee to Zion. Here he's warning us of it. Babylon will fall, come out. And how do you say come out of Babylon in one word? Repent. How do you say prepare for the coming of the Lord in one word? Repent. How do you sum up the Lord's voice of warning in one word? Repent. Jesus makes all of that possible. Verse 17, he then says, wherefore, and again, this great conjunction, wherefore is consequently, as a, as a result of, because of everything I've said up to this point, wherefore, notice what he says next, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth. No wonder there needs to be a voice of warning. A calamity is coming. A calamity of fire that's kindled, a calamity of divine anger, a calamity that comes of unrepented sin. Because of that calamity, what has the Lord done to offset it? He has called upon his servant, Joseph Smith, Jr. That's how he refers to him here, as servant. That title will change with time. But he's called upon his servant, Joseph, and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments. In fact, a whole book of them. This book of commandments this book of doctrine and of covenants. And it's not just for him. Again, it's got to start somewhere with a chosen servant who then extends it to others, who then extend it beyond to all the world. He also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things unto the world and all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. God vindicating the prophets as he always does. But you see these concentric circles that keep being brought up? Hearken ye people of my church, listen ye isles of the sea. I'm calling my disciples who will send the word to everyone else. I'm giving it to them so they can give it to you, O inhabitants of the earth. I'm calling my servant Joseph. He'll give commandments to others. They'll extend those commandments to all the world. Now I recognize that's a tall order. No wonder he says in verse 19, the weak things of the world. That includes Joseph. That includes his fellow disciples. That includes you and me. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, or at least the ones who consider themselves mighty and strong. Hinted at that back in verse 16, those that are walking in their own way, those that are after the image of their own gods. Babylon does an incredible job of making people feel that they are mighty and strong in themselves and don't need any of the strength and might that comes from the Lord himself. Talk about an object lesson for not putting your trust in the arm of flesh. The Lord chooses servants with the least flesh on their arms imaginable, the weakest, the simplest, to go break down the mighty and the strong, so that it becomes this ultimate visual aid, as, as he says at the end of 19, that man should not counsel his fellow man, 
neither trust in the arm of flesh. Why would you trust counsel from a mere mortal, a fellow fallen child of God? Look higher. Hear the voice of the Lord. Why would you trust in your own arm or in the arm of flesh? God's arm is revealed. He's got the sword of the word and the spirit. Trust in that. That's what the restoration is for. Wherefore, he's unrolled it. That's why he's called Joseph Smith in the first place, why these revelations are coming forth. And then he lists some beautiful purposes for the restoration. This is what it's all for. Verse 20, that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. I love that. I love it every time I see a new father give a first father's blessing for a newborn as they're nervous and stumbling over the language. And I just think that is someone speaking in the name of God, the Lord. And he wants every home to have that opportunity. And not just priesthood ordination here, not just every man. This is every daughter and son of God to be able to share the message of truth, to function in the name of God by the authority of God, to speak in the name of God. This is a true priesthood of all believers. And best of all, this priesthood of all believers is actual priesthood. It really is restored authority from heaven. If nothing else from 2020 and the closing of chapels and the need to have home church, do you sense that happening on a greater and greater level that every one of us is speaking in the name of God? What will happen as a result of that? Verse 21. One of the ultimate purposes of the restoration, that faith also might increase in the earth. I've shared this before. One of my favorite verses in scripture is the haunting question Jesus asks in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The restoration of the gospel is intended to make that answer a resounding yes. By calling us and commissioning us, by addressing us and authorizing us, by asking us to speak in his name, by convincing the weak and the simple to go forth and share the gospel with the mighty and strong. Faith is increasing in the earth. By opening the heavens and calling prophets and apostles again, faith is flourishing. Faith is increasing upon the earth. By giving us new scripture to study, new missions to perform, a covenant to fix in order to keep, ordinances to bring back on the straight and narrow to mark this covenant path. This is so that faith might increase. When the Lord comes again, will he find it here? If the restoration does what it's designed to do, you better believe he will. And what's all that for? See, each verse seems to be crescendoing into the next. Everyone needs to speak in the name of God. Why so faith? increase. And why must faith increase? 22, that my everlasting covenant might be established. The one that was broken back in verse 15. It has to be fixed. It has to be reestablished. That's going to take faith and it's going to take work. We have to help God keep his word to bring all of his children home. This is the Abrahamic covenant, that all the kindreds of the earth shall be blessed. This is the covenant to Enoch, that Zion from above will return and meet Zion from below, that the kingdom of God will go forth so the kingdom of heaven shall come. This is the covenant to Adam and Eve, that as they were driven out of Eden, the promise was made and illustrated through the covenant of sacrifice that Jesus would make it possible for all to return to the presence of God. You only ate the fruit of one tree. There's still another one in Eden, and it's the tree of life that I want you to return and partake of. This is the covenant of the heavenly council. When the Lord asked, whom shall I send? Send to do what? To go to the earth and condescend, to bring us up back with him. That requires the restoration as we all roll up our sleeves and engage with God in his saving work that my everlasting covenant might be established. And what will that require? Verse 23, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by, here they are again, the weak and the simple, unto whom? Unto the ends of the world, before kings and rulers. 23 is such a beautiful echo of 19. If you feel too weak or too simple to do the work, 
It's your weakness and simplicity that qualify you for it. It's that inadequacy that makes you adequate. Such a beautiful irony there. If men will come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. Remember Ether 12, 27? He needs that humility in us so that we trust in him instead of trusting in ourselves. That's the best thing about greeny missionaries. They don't know anything. That's the bad news. But they know they don't know anything. That's the good news. And so they put all their trust in the Lord and he makes them into incredibly powerful instruments. The worst thing about missionaries near the end, and I was guilty of this, they still don't know anything. But unfortunately, now they think they do. All of us are weak and simple compared to God. No matter how much we learn, we are still unlearned compared to Him. No matter how much flesh we are able to amass on our arms, we are still weak compared to the arm of God. Every good thing comes from Him. So give Him the credit, all the glory. When I am weak, then I am strong, Paul said. So glory in that. So you are glorying in the Lord. Now he's going to dwell on that weakness and simplicity a little longer. He gets more specific in verse 24 because he says, Behold, I am God and have spoken it. So ultimately these are God's words. I'm God. I've spoken it. These commandments are of me. He's claiming them. But even though they originate in the mind of God, they have to pass through the minds and mouths of mortal men. And that leaves some human fingerprints on them. Now that should not offend us or depress us or scandalize us. As Christians, we believe in the doctrine of the incarnation, that God became man, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus was fully divine and fully human. That's a beautiful proving of contraries. And so even though these are God's words, divine fingerprints all over them, His commandments, still, how's the verse end? They were given unto my servants in their weakness, after the manner of their language. And it has to be that way, that they might come to understanding. If it's not according to their language, then how on earth will they understand it at all? This is part of the condescension of God as well, that he's willing to communicate to us in a way that we'll actually understand him. God is so far beyond our mortal comprehension. We speak of him as the ineffable. The fact he can bring heaven down to earth to us at all is amazing. In fact, that's one of the things that Brigham Young loved about Joseph Smith. He said that Joseph just had an ability to bring heaven down to earth. It was Joseph's prophetic gifts that gave him that glimpse of heaven. But it was his ability to communicate in, in a regular way. He was not a man of great eloquence. He had so little education. He grew into some incredible gifts as far as communication was concerned. But even as the Book of Mormon first rolled off the press, people mocked at its language, at its grammar, because Joseph wasn't very well educated. We'll see similar worries and complaints about the Doctrine and Covenants when that conference assembled in 1831. The Lord calls out some of the prideful there and more educated. But he, here he gives it to us right from the very start, this first initial revelation. Yes, you will see human fingerprints there. But look closer. You'll see the image of God all over these pages as well. Remember we saw this at the end of the Book of Mormon last year. Moroni, more than anyone, just so worried about his own weakness in writing. Worrying about erring or the mistakes of men. Joseph felt the same way. In a letter to W.W. Phelps, who was so much better educated and so much more eloquent. No wonder he was chosen to publish these words. No wonder he became the newspaper editor and writing hymns or lyrics for hymns and so on. Joseph said to him, he complained about this little narrow prison of paper and pen and ink and a crooked, broken, scattered and imperfect language. Can you sense his frustration with himself, his own inadequacy? As he said in the same letter, it is an awful responsibility to write in the name of the Lord. Like those stages of authorization we talked about. It's like Joseph was very comfortable with the first revelation, but the second making it into scripture, writing it down where people can look at it instead of just experience it, study it and pour over it and check your grammar instead of just being in the moment and experiencing things. This must have come as great reassurance.
It's okay, your weakness. I choose the weak and the simple. Don't worry about your language. Eventually, you will learn the language of God. In the meantime, if you have a rustic patriarch, prepare for a rustic patriarchal blessing. If your patriarch is an eloquent professor of rhetoric, then yours might show greater signs of polished prose. But the ultimate voice is the one that lies behind either instrument, and that's the voice of God. He will speak to you in a way that you will understand, whether it's through scripture, whether it's through inspiration, whether it's through music, or whether it's through nature. There are so many ways that God speaks to us because he loves us and wants us to understand. That should also prepare us for the possibility of needed improvement in the revelations of God. Remember, he said this often, line upon line and precept upon precept. There's a great journal entry for the prophet at the end of 1832, where he simply wrote, I wrote and corrected the revelations. Wait, you corrected the revelations? I thought they came from God the first time. Oh, they did. But I'm understanding them better. I'm learning more. Is there a better way to say this? My father is a patriarch, and he's told me it's interesting to watch the process of revelation continue even after the person has left his home. There are times where he is transcribing, and again, he recorded it, right? That's audio recorded. But as he is transcribing these things, often the revelation will continue of, now there's a word that's out of place there. Or did that convey exactly what I was feeling at the time? Again, at that November 1831 conference, some of the more educated, a little bit concerned about the language that Joseph used. Again, we'll see that when we get to section 67, I believe. But at the conference, they resolved that Joseph Smith should correct those errors or mistakes which he may discover by the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't perfect the first time, that's okay. Improve upon it. Correct it. In fact, it reminds me of the experience that Elder Richard G. Scott had. Famous story that he's told multiple times where he was receiving this flood of revelation and he was writing it down as quickly as he could keep up with the Holy Ghost. But at, when he came to a lull, which kind of catch his breath, he made the important decision to ask God if he got it right. Again, it's hard to bring heaven down to earth. It's hard to make the ineffable effable. It's hard to put in paper or in print a feeling or impression that you've received. Well, Elder Scott wanted to make sure, did I do justice to what you were trying to tell me? Leave yourself room for improvement, for greater understanding, for correction. In fact, it's one of the reasons that we're called upon to counsel in our councils. Revelation is hard. And often it takes my peace compared to your peace and discussing and sharing and counseling together until we come to a better understanding of exactly what the Lord would have us know. Joseph even did some of that counseling with his counsel there in that conference. He asked Oliver Cowdery, who had helped him with scripture often in the past. Oliver was much more educated than Joseph was. Sidney Rigdon helped, incredible minister and preacher, great command of the Word of God already. W.W. W. Phelps helped with his eloquent gifts. But even with their assistance, Joseph cautioned them, please be careful not to alter the sense of the revelations. I know I got the sense right. That impression was clear. It's just how to put it into words that can be difficult. Even when these revelations ultimately went to press, Oliver Cowdery said that the Revelation texts are now correct, if not in every word, at least in principle. I think there's beautiful balance there. Not to be so caught up over every single word or punctuation mark, but is the principle conveyed? Do you get the idea of what God is trying to help us understand? Brigham Young was even bolder in his description of this principle, and boldness was one of his gifts. He said, I do not believe that there is a single revelation among the many God has given to the church that is perfect in its fullness. The revelations of God contain correct doctrine and principle, so far as they go, but it is impossible for the poor, weak, low, groveling, sinful inhabitants of the earth to receive a revelation from the Almighty in all its perfections. He has to speak to us in a manner to meet the extent of our capacities. I hope you don't take Brigham Young's words to make you think less of God's revelation. 
I hope you take them to think a little less of yourself. For God to communicate with us, there is a requirement of incredible condescension. I hope we can be okay with that. In fact, I hope we can be incredibly grateful and humbled by that. As we grow up in God, as we learn to become fluent in the language of heaven, revelations will continue to come line upon line, precept upon precept. Their fullness will arrive once we arrive at the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ, as Paul said. Their perfection will come once we have become perfected in Christ. Now, once you have that in mind, once verse 24 is firmly established, divine fingerprints, they are God's commandments, they are of Him. He is God, He has spoken them. And human fingerprints, given unto men according to our weakness so that we can understand. Once we have that in mind, then what are these revelations for? We saw the purposes of the restoration, increase faith, fix the covenant, let everyone speak in God's name. Well, what are the purposes of these revelations? Verse 25, inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known. God's word alerts us when we err. Verse 26, and inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. God's words instruct us when we seek God's wisdom. Verse 27, inasmuch as they sinned, they might be chastened, that they might repent. God's words chasten us and correct us when we sin, so that we can make the necessary changes. This is his voice of warning to all people. Prepare, repent. Verse 28, inasmuch as they were humble, they might be made strong, and bless from on high, and receive knowledge from time to time. God's word is meant to strengthen us, and bless us, and inform us. And it does just that when we are humble. Humble enough to recognize our distance from God and begin to close that distance. As we come unto him, he makes weak things strong. That strength, those blessings, that knowledge, they come from on high, the source of real strength. And they come from time to time. So be patient. Now in 29, he gives us one example of how that's happened through the word of God. After having received the record of the Nephites, here's the Book of Mormon. Yea, even my servant Joseph Smith Jr. might have power to translate through the mercy of God, by the power of God, the Book of Mormon. So there's one example of God instructing us with wisdom and, and correcting us in our faults and giving us line upon line strength and blessings and knowledge. The Book of Mormon does all of that. So does the Doctrine and Covenants. Verse 30 starts leading into that, this foundation of the church. Also those to whom these commandments were given. So the Book of Mormon came forth, by the way, by God's power and by God's mercy. Remember, every time they asked Joseph, how did you translate this? He always simply answered with two words, the gift and power of God. Power is here. Gift is here. It's a gift of mercy. Such a merciful gift God gives us in his scriptures. Then in verse 30, also those to whom these commandments were given, this book full of them, that they might have power to lay the foundation of this church. And laying that foundation will be a process of trial and error. When, as they err, it'll be made known. It'll be a process of seeking wisdom and gaining instruction, like we saw in 26. It'll be a process, sadly, of sin and chastisement and repentance. The early saints were far from perfect, but they sought to become perfected in Christ. They and the church they laid the foundation of was made strong and blessed from on high, and it has received knowledge from time to time. And if laying the foundation was their responsibility, then ours comes in the next phrase, and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness. Are we doing that? Starting with us so that we can spread the news to all the islands of the sea, the inhabitants of the earth? Are we bringing it forth out of obscurity, out of darkness? Are we shining a light on it? Or better yet, are we letting our light so shine to the world that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven? Is it shining light into a darkened world? 
The church better be doing that. That's the purpose of its existence. Notice how he describes the church as the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. Now, there's a lot there. I love that twofold definition of the church. It is not just true. It is true and living, and that's a beautiful contrary. Truth seems to be static, uniform, unbending, unchanging. It's just true and true as true can be. Knowledge of things as they were and as they are and as they will be. That's what truth is as the Lord defines it. But what about living? Living isn't static. It isn't stationary or stable. Living is changing. It's growing. It's adapting. Living suggests that it has judgment and flexibility and empathy and mercy. A living church is relational and welcoming and real. That's not meant to diminish it from its truthfulness at all. But in some ways, it adds to that truth by adding a dose of reality in all of its messiness. In some ways, something that is only true is unapproachable by mere mortals like me. But if it's true and living, then it can reach down to me to lift me up. There's condescension there. You see, if we have that contrary in mind from verse 24, divinity and humanity, that's one of the most important contraries to see running throughout the history of the church. When I see people struggle with things, I often think, oh, were you expecting only divinity? And did you overcorrect and now assume that it is only humanity? Both coincided throughout it all. And if you were blind to its humanity early on in your membership, Please don't overcorrect by becoming blind to its divinity now that you think you know better. Both sides have been there all along. It is God's word and mortal weakness. It is true and it is living. It's divine and human. It's iron rod and liahona. The iron rod is true, fixed, immovable. The liahona is living. The spindles move and the language changes and sometimes it seems to work and sometimes it doesn't because of the diligence and heed that I pay or don't pay to it. I'm living. And sometimes that means I'm I'm sick and other times it means that it's healthy. It means that I'm growing. It means that I'm developing. The church is too. And it's collectively that the Lord is pleased with it. Not individually. Individually, people make mistakes. But it's amazing that the church is one of those synergistic miracles where the total is greater than the sum of its parts. Now that's not meant to excuse the individual and hide them in the mass that seems to bring up the average. We'll actually see that in a revelation later on in the Doctrine and Covenants that seems to flip this and let let us all know that the Lord has an eye on the individual too. So please do not use this verse to to rationalize sin or justify ourselves, saying, well, at least we average out to be being pretty good. Team me up with with President Nelson, will you? Uh, Together, I'll lower him a bit, but boy, does he bring me up. No, no, be careful about that. But please be aware that in the collective, the body of Christ, the eye not saying to the foot, I don't need you, my weaknesses being compensated with your strengths. Somehow, the Lord lifting all of us as we lift one another higher. That is something that is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, he stays on that last thought for a couple more verses. When he speaks of being pleased collectively but not individually, he lets us know in 31, I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. That's why I can't be pleased with everyone individually because I notice every sin in each of you, which is why I am sending this voice of warning to call you to repentance. Will you hearken and hear and do that? We sometimes boast in having a high pain threshold. Well, having a high sin threshold is nothing to be proud of. The Lord has a, the lowest imaginable sin threshold, not the least degree. And yet, flip that over and see in verse 32, Nevertheless, here's what should restore the hope for us, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord. 
shall be forgiven. You can even bring in the beautiful words from the end of Mosiah. As often as my people repent, I will forgive them. That is merciful. But this is justice as well. Justice in 31, mercy in 32. The order there is key. God's justice seems to always precede God's mercy. It has to be that way. If you preach mercy alone and then try to sneak in justice, it'll never get a word in edgewise. Preach justice and then reassure people with mercy when they fall short. And notice also the two halves of 32. He that repents, there's the elimination of the negative, and does the commandments. There's the addition of the positive. We're trying to eliminate both sins of commission and sins of omission here, right? There's some good uh, arithmetic. Minus a negative and add a positive. You saw the same thing in King Benjamin's address, at least at the people's response to it. We have no more disposition to do evil. That's subtract the negative. But to do good continually, that's add the positive. It's repent and do the commandments, and then you'll be forgiven. On the other hand, verse 33, He that repents not, from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with man, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you remember that haunting phrase from Mormon's words at the end of the Book of Mormon? He says that repeatedly. I fear that the spirit has ceased striving with my people. They are past feeling such hardness of heart. I hope that never becomes true of us. Verse 34, the Lord then expands his audience to the, to the ultimate again. Again, verily I say unto you, O inhabitants of the earth, this message is for all, I the Lord am willing to make these things known unto all flesh, for I am no respecter of persons. He keeps doing it. He started this chapter with my church, but within the same breath moves it forward to all people. Isles of the sea. He is no respecter of persons, even as he is assembling a group of chosen disciples. He's only choosing them so they'll choose everyone else. And then he says this in 35 and 36. It's fascinating to watch this polarization take place. If you were to graph humanity throughout history and put it on a scale of righteousness to wickedness, throughout most of history it would probably be a regular old bell curve with the mass of humanity somewhere in the middle and the occasional outlier of incredible righteousness or incredible wickedness. But those are fewer and further between. Now, the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the graph begins to shift from a bell curve to something more like a U curve, a polarization of righteousness and wickedness with much less middle ground. Notice how he says it in 35. I will that all men shall know that the day speedily cometh. The hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth. Remember, this is a voice of warning. Prepare ye, prepare ye, for the day of the Lord is nigh. Peace shall be taken from the earth, and here's why. There's a war to be waged. It's the same war that, that took place in heaven. It's now here upon the earth, and it's the same forces fighting toward the same ends. End of 35 describes one half, and 36 describes the other. The devil shall have power over his own dominion, and also the Lord shall have power over his saints. You sense that polarization? The two generals have come forth, and the armies have assembled to them. The devil has power over his dominions. You sense why so many sins in our day are of the addictive type? The devil wants to remove agency. That's always what he's been against. And as he exercises power over his dominions, it's people that find no way out. The chains of hell they're described as. Compared to verse 36, the Lord has power over his saints. Now there seems to be equal obedience on on either side, but for completely opposite reasons. On the side of the adversary, it's addiction, the chains of sin. On the side of the Lord, it is not addiction, it is submission. It's not the destruction of one's agency on the adversary's army. It's the the offering of one's agency on the Lord's. In the enemy's camp, it's, I cannot choose to abandon him. And in the Lord's camp, I would never choose to walk away. 
You see that happening in our day? More and more distance between real righteousness and real wickedness. Can you sense Joshua crying to all of us, choose you this day whom you will serve? Can you hear Elijah shouting from the top of Mount Carmel, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. We are living in this day of polarization. And there is less and less middle ground. When the bullets start flying, you don't stand in the middle of the battlefield. You pick a side and you dive in the trenches. There is no spiritual Switzerland here. If the Lord is God, then follow him. Offer him your will. Let the Lord have power over you, his saint. And that way he will come and reign in our midst and come down in judgment upon Idumea or the world. I remember earlier on in this revelation, he described the world as Babylon, the great which shall fall. Well, here he describes it as Idumea, but it means the same thing. It's always representative or metaphoric of the world. It's Babylon as opposed to Zion. It's Edom as opposed to Israel. Remember, Edom was a neighboring tribal area in the Old Testament. Edom is, is the descendants of Esau, whereas Israel is the descendants of Jacob. And Jacob and Esau, it's almost Abel and Cain, or Nephi and Laman. You have these different sides, and which side will you be on? Again, no middle ground. He could have used any other number of, of worldly metaphors. He could have spoken of Egypt as opposed to Canaan. He could have spoken of Sodom and Gomorrah as opposed to Jerusalem. No matter what metaphor he chooses, they all represent the wicked world. And it's a world he is pleading with us to come out of. And he makes that beautifully clear in section 133, the appendix. But here in the, in the preface, same invitation. And again, how do you say come out of Idumea in a single word? Repent. Now he concludes this revelation with verse 37, 8, and 9. Search these commandments. Don't search for them. Hopefully we're long past the stage where I can't find my scriptures. They're here in front of us. Don't just read them. Don't skim over them. Search these commandments. Study them as if your life depended upon it, because it does spiritually. Search them because they are true, and more than true, they are faithful. This is like true and living. This is iron rod and liahona. This is true and faithful that he's not going to give up on us lowly mortals. That's the faithfulness of God's word. Not just holding on to his antiseptic, unyielding truth. Again, I'm not trying to diminish truth in any way, but I'm trying to temper it with human reality, that God's word is faithful, that he knows what we're made of, he knows that we are dust, and he condescends to our level to understand us in hopes that someday we'll understand him. That's what makes me love so much the word that Alma uses in Alma 32 as he's describing this experiment upon the word. As he talks about it being planted and talks about it growing, he says, is not this real? He doesn't just say, isn't it true? He says, isn't it real? Reality includes truth, but it also includes all the messiness that we endure on the way to truth. It's truth and it's life. It's true and living. It's true and faithful. It's real. And those of you who are struggling with any issue in church history saying, but it's not true enough, it's not perfect enough, please make room for its faithfulness, its living nature, its raw reality. Because look in the mirror and you'll see all of that yourself. I'm so grateful God can make something true out of something real. And it all comes down to his faithfulness that he will not give up on us just like he will not give up on his church. He's still pleased collectively and he's holding out hope for each of us individually. Search these commandments. They're true and faithful. The prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. And never read the prophecies independent of the promises. He'll make that clear in section 45. 
Sometimes the prophecies can concern us, trouble us. This is a voice of warning after all. But the promises are always there to reassure us. The prophecies are an illustration of God's justice. The promises are an illustration of his mercy. The prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. Verse 38, what I the Lord have spoken, I have spoken. If I said it, I said it and I'm sticking to it. I'm not backing up. I'm not pulling back. I'm not offering any excuses. That's what he says in the next phrase. I excuse not myself. Not even when I have a perfectly well-built-in one, namely, I'm working through mere mortals. No, even through them, I'm not excusing myself. I am able to do mine own work, he says twice to Nephi. I've got this. And even though I am choosing to work through weak and simple instruments, I promise it will all be fulfilled. Though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled. Bank on it. And then this beautiful, well-known phrase, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. We're seeing this shift of authority from heaven to earth, from God to servant. And whether God's voice saying, hearken and hear, or the prophet's voice saying, come and repent, either way, it's the same thing. When you hear God's prophets, aren't you hearing him? Can you recognize in their voices the tender and firm voice of the Lord? I'm so grateful for the opportunity to practice that recognition over and over through the words of living prophets as I strain my ears to hear the voice of God. He then concludes in verse 39, Behold and lo, the Lord is God. Keep that in mind through all that we'll see from this moment forward. The Spirit beareth record, and I trust the Spirit telling you what it tells us here, that the record is true, and the truth abideth forever and ever. Amen. I pray that throughout this year of Doctrine and Covenant study, you will sense that, that you will know that the Lord is God, that the Spirit will bear record to you, that these words are his, and that the words of his servants come from him originally. I pray that ultimately we will be able to say what the Lord said we'd say in section 18. These words are not of men nor of man, but of me. Yes, they pass through men, but they are my words. There's this, this passage is full of beautiful possessive pronouns. The Lord claims these things as his own. Wherefore, you shall testify that they are of me and not of man. For it is my voice which speaketh them unto you. Hearken, hear. They are given by my spirit unto you, and by my power you can read them one to another. And save it were by my power, you could not have them. Wherefore, you can testify that you have heard my voice and know my words. That's how we need to approach the Doctrine and Covenants this year. Studying it through God's power and by God's Spirit. And I can promise you, my friends, that if we do it in that way, then we will be able to testify that we have heard God's voice. And it will be familiar to us. At that first conference, where they took revelation and made sure it became scripture that could then become canon, the assembled saints voted that they prize the revelations to be worth to the church the riches of the whole earth. I love the Doctrine and Covenants. I love its message of truth. I love its call to repentance. I love its witness of Jesus Christ. It is so much more than a book of rules, Grandma. It is the Word of God. And I will do my best this year to try to convey it with the power and spirit of God that it deserves. I testify that these words are not of man nor of men, but of God, and they are worth worlds.